Today in Game Changer, we're speaking to a remarkable woman. Her name is Kolis Wasitole, and she is an award-winning documentary maker. I discovered her through watching her documentary, Forgotten Children of Zimbabwe, and I can say that it was one of the most emotional, um, traumatizing, and inspirational at the same time uh, documentaries that I've ever watched. So I urge you to watch it. It'll, it'll really change your life. It's a story of three incredible young children representing the whole of Zimbabwe. Um, it'll really move you and you have to watch it. I went into this interview really looking at if, if I could delve deep into what it, what it takes to become a, a documentary filmmaker, but we got diverted really onto how um, uh, Koliswa looks at life, her philosophy on life, her views on life, and I was blown away. There's an immense amount of rich, rich wisdom that she shares with us. Um, it'll leave you inspired, it'll leave you feeling changed. Um, I call her a social activist. I don't think that she labels herself at all like that. But through the work that she does, she's able to raise people's consciousness about certain issues. And she has created remarkable change. The, the impact and effects of what her documentaries have done has been incredible. Um, I feel really blessed to, to have met her and to have this conversation with her. And I know that you will after watching this because she's an individual who's able to find light in darkness. Um, it's a cheesy line, but it's absolutely true of what she does. She, she looks at the most devastating um, injustices in society, but she provides hope at the end and incredible change. So watch it, and, and, and I hope you enjoy it and you're inspired. And again, check out her documentaries that she's made. It'll blow you away. As always, leave your comments down in the section below. Let us know what you thought of um, this interview. Let us know what you think about the documentaries. She also has the most, my favorite quote now, for how to live life. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Let us know what you think it is at the bottom. When you hear it, um, it'll resonate with you. Um, and if you have any questions for her, ask as well. We'll try to get her to respond. Enjoy. Barbara's Forgotten Children. And it was the most moving experience I've ever had in, in my life. And, and I say that kind of uh, looking at across everything. My wife and I sat in a cinema with, with a whole bunch of people where everybody was just sobbing and our insides were t torn inside out. And I think it's the kind of film, and I said this in the email to you, that I think it's the kind of film that everybody has to watch um, to understand what's happening in the world and to understand how good we have it as well. But I wanted to ask you, because you're a documentary maker, you're a filmmaker, you have a production company, um, how do you define what you do? Because a lot of the results of what you do create social change and improve people's lives. So do you see yourself at all in, in, in and, and without being humble, because people obviously don't like to kind of talk themselves up too much, but do you see yourself as a kind of a social revolutionist or, or I don't know what the right word is, but what is it that drives you? What is that under, uh, underlying... Um, uh, what drives me is is a passion for justice. Politically, I'm a socialist, and I believe that in this world we should collectively work at trying to create a more egalitarian society. I really believe that what happens is in regards to maybe women, children, issues around poverty, those issues are actually more systematic, you know, than people being seen as being lazy, yeah. you know. So I have always wanted to create work that makes you want to do something. I've always wanted to create work or to be part of creating work that informs, educates, but you must want to do something because there is a lot of um, unfairness in the world. Mm. And yes, of course, we can go through life saying, well, that's life, tough titty, you know, I'm just doing my bit. But these things have far reaching consequences in terms of our safety as people, in terms of my daughter's life in terms of the world she is going to inherit. And so I do think that in our lives as people, we can do whatever little we can. And to be quite honest with you, you know, like Margaret Mead said that, you know, to be quite honest, it's only been a group of small committed 
a small group of committed people that have actually ever changed the world. Yeah. And so I really think that, you know, we have the power to to do something with uh, our abilities, whatever gift God gave you, you can actually make a difference. And, and so what is the, the area that, and I don't want to get too far um, into this interview before we actually go back to talk about the actual documentary so that we can kind of set the context for our audience. But before we get there, I just want to ask you one question. What is it that, the, the areas that you want to focus on, because a lot of your documentaries focus on children. So is it children as, a, as general or is it specific areas within them? You know, it's very interesting. I've always been interested in, you know, in, in making films about children. My very, very first independent documentary was about uh, young girls in 2000. What happens to them when they lose their parents to HIV AIDS? Yes. And at that time in South Africa, you know, there was a lot of denial around that. And Thabo Mbeki's denialism did not help. And I'm, I'm really more interested in the girl child. I'm a feminist. So I am actually interested in gender issues. And, uh, but also at the same time, I realize that, you know, I cannot be uh, too, excuse me, <clears throat> I cannot be too myopic, you know, I cannot be too tunnel vision in terms of what it is that I want to explore. But I'm interested in women's issues and I'm interested in children, children because actually they don't really have a voice. You know, and uh, poor people don't actually really have a voice. So I'm interested in, in, in issues around poverty and human rights and justice. All right. But poverty is my, is, is my main thing. Okay. So um, I, I can, um, I've got about 15 questions lined up that I want to keep on asking. But if we can just step back and just talk about the Forgotten Children of Zimbabwe. Um, so you, you went into Zimbabwe with a different agenda of what you wanted to be filmed. Um, could, and, and then decided to take a, a different angle on it. Could you talk us through how that happened and also focusing probably more on what the documentary is about? Okay, what actually happened was that I, in 2005, I went to Zimbabwe to ask for permission to make a documentary called Return to Zimbabwe. I went to Zimbabwe when I was three years old you know, from South Africa as a refugee. So I was born, raised, in, not born, sorry, but nurtured in Zimbabwe. And I wanted to make a film where I go back to Zimbabwe and I try to unpack, you know, Zimbabwe's journey through my eyes, from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe to post-colonialism. Yes. Unpack it, you know, uh, because actually those things are more complex than meets the eye. And uh, subsequently, when the cleanup operation happened in 2005, because I, I always, always supported ZANU-PF, because, you know, as a black person who grew up in a very political family, you know, my um, cousin was Edson Sitole, who was abducted by Ian Smith in 1976 or 75. And we were raised to believe that one day we will be liberate, liberated and one day we were going to take over. Uh, so I always tried to, you know, to, 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 you know, yeah, bad things were happening, but I always saw it within the context of, of revolution. Yes. And what, you, what people must understand is that we were brought up during the time of the Cold War. So politically, our politics, you know, are very different to modern day kids. And my family was, you know, my mother married into that family. So they were politically involved, you know. But then what happened with the cleanup operation, I, I lost it. And I just thought that, no, I can't, I have the gift to, to bear witness to whatever is going on anywhere. And I have a company that I work with in England called uh, True Vision TV. And so basically we started communicating and then we met with Channel 4 and with BBC. I had produced a documentary for True Vision. I'd been an associate producer for True Vision in 2005. And it was for the BBC. It was called Orphans of Inkandla. Mm. And I won a BAFTA for that. Yes. So it wasn't difficult to go back and to say that I have access into Zimbabwe, you know. And we need to make a film that is going to show the plight of children in very, very difficult 
political and economic circumstances. So, it, it, you know, it was very interesting because the BBC didn't think that we were going to pull it off. And I said, no, Zimbabwe is my country and I'm divinely protected. Yeah. And I'm divinely guided, yes. you know, because you have to examine your intention, you know, always when you do something and you have to pray about it. So I went into Zimbabwe with my uh, camera person, who director camera person, who's one of the most experienced undercover camera people. He did uh, China Stolen Children. He did Tibet. You know, it's, it's Jezza Newman. A lot of, you know, so basically, you know, we, we, we went in for nine months, in and out, in and out. And uh, we obviously, we would have never achieved what we achieved had it not been for the NGOs on the ground. Okay. I don't, okay, oh yeah, you want to know. So we, we, we wanted to look at what was it that was affecting children in Zimbabwe. It's difficult, you know what I mean? We knew that HIV AIDS is one of them. We knew that education, because Zimbabwe has had a reputation for education. Mugabe's reputation and Mugabe's um, thing had been about educating his people, which sadly, you know, he is not going to be remembered for that because of what subsequently he has done to the country and to his people. So, but we didn't think that we would make a film on education. We just toyed with some of these things. We looked at hunger. We looked at, so we, 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 we met kids, a lot of kids. We interviewed children. And when you're interviewing kids, you, you, you have to go with your sixth sense. Because as a documentary filmmaker, you don't know how the story is going to unfold. You don't. So you have to think, okay, how, what are the children living on? How are they coping? What is going on? So eventually we came up with the kids that we came up with and it ended up being about education. I mean, you know, who would do a documentary on education? That seems really boring. But somehow it ended up being about that. And I think that it was, it was really, it was interesting how it came out because I think maybe that was the universe's intention to throw that back to the leadership of Zimbabwe, that this was your legacy, mm -hmm. but it's no longer your legacy anymore. And I mean, <clears throat> that's quite an important point, because as you said, if when Mugabe started as, as ruling the country, everything that he did was, was almost brilliant. I mean, his focus on healthcare and education, and it just seemed like the perfect platform, and then it went astray. Has, has there been a response from the Zimbabwean government to you? Do, do you know if they... <laughs> No, they haven't responded, but uh, you know, one of the sad things about this documentary and also the sad thing about people in leadership, they have a way of treating countries as if it's their own backyards. Mm. So a good friend of mine who gave me permission to make the original film, which by the way is called Child of the Revolution, and by the way I've actually finished shooting that film and so that film is coming out okay. and it's really really looking at how uh, us as children we were betrayed by the revolution and so it's looking at Zimbabwe but actually it's looking at Africa as a whole you know because I am a child of the revolution whether it is the ANC revolution or whether it's the ZANU PF revolution or whether it's Nkwame Nkuruma's revolution or you know what I'm trying to say, or whether it is Julius Nyerere, I am a child who grew up in the 70s. So that revolution, I feel, has betrayed me and a lot, and I, and I try to unpack, mm. you know, the dream deferred. So going back to the um, Zimbabwean leadership, no, I mean, you know, one or two people did tell me that they were pretty pissed off because uh, what I did, I behaved like a traitor. And, but then that is language that was used during the Cold War. And ZANU-PF has failed to progress mm -hmm. as a political party. At some point, some of us could have been part of that political party. You know, if you look at Frelimo in Mozambique, 
Frelimo as a political party evolved from being a revolutionary and a, and a party that liberates people to being a party that is pro-business, pro-development, pro-this, pro-that. ZANU-PF has failed to do that. They are still stuck, you know, in that modus operandi of the 80s and the 70s. Yeah. So, yes, of course, and it's also about, it's, it's, it's them or us. You're either with them or, you know. So, of course, you know, one or two people did tell me that, you know, I, I, I sold out. And um, I can live with that. Hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you because um, you're, you're one of the following documentaries, The Last Girls of South Africa, um, is also extremely powerful. It seemed to, the, initially it seemed to generate a response from government where you invited into parliament to have a discussion around it. Um, and there was a response. Has something actually substantial happened from that? from a government perspective rather than from a public personal NGO perspective? Okay, uh, actually, South Africa's Lost Girls, I was a producer on that. Uh, Deborah Shipley, a friend of mine who is uh, one of the directors of True Vision, she was the director of that. Yeah. It's a company I work with. Okay. And it wasn't the parliament here. What actually happened was that kids in England, when they saw that film, they wrote letters, you know, to their local government officials. And, and there was a lot of activism around that film, but it was more in terms of activism that happened in England, and the film was also shown in Australia. And in fact, there was a huge response, people writing to Jacob Zuma about it, and also people writing to the minister, sorry, writing to the ambassador, South African ambassador to London, Zola Square, who, in my opinion, was probably one of the best ministers we ever had in this country in terms of his commitment and his passion towards yeah. poor people, children, and the elderly. He was the minister of, of social welfare. But no, nothing, you know, I mean, you know, as these things go, <laughs> we live in so called democracies whereby leadership really, really believes they are above people. And um, I really don't think leadership really gives a toss about the arts. So it's like, yeah, bruhaha, that's them, the artists. But I have to say that within the context of ordinary people, all of these documentaries, you know, they've garnered a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, talk, a lot of financial help. They are used in terms of, you know, uh, education purposes by NGOs. Some of them have raised a lot of money. I mean, Zimbabwe's forgotten children not only raised money for the kids in the film until, you know, they finish school. The same documentary is being used to raise money for 10 schools in Zimbabwe. The same documentary was used to be part of raising money for Red Nose Week in England, and Red Nose Week raised the most amount of money last year than they've ever... It's work. Excuse me, please. Hmm? This is work, darling. I'm, being, I'm doing an interview. Okay, can okay, you go and ask Auntie Beauty? Okay, sweetheart. Okay. So, you know, I mean, Red Nose Week used that, you know, a, a, a clip of that to raise money. And in terms of their graph, where most of the money was donated. It was donated during the time that Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children was being shown. And Red Nose Week raised, I think, more than 80 million last year, pounds. Wow. 80 million you know, pounds. And, yeah, and all of this money was going, is going to global charities. I'm not saying that it's Zimbabwe's Forgotten, but it was part yes. of the Red Nose Week. And, okay. and when you look at the graph of when people donated money, the most money was donated when Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children, and all of that money goes to global charities. So, as an artist, you do what you can, and if your work can go beyond doing that, then that's really, really, that, that's great. But I don't do that. You know, the people at True Vision, they do that. They set up the charity, they run, they run around and raise money, but also in England, when you raise so much money through your work or charity, the government, the British government, tops that as well. Wow. 
Okay. So the same thing happened with orphans of Inkandla, you know. Elton John used a clip of old, you know what I mean, of orphans of Inkandla for his uh, for his charity ball. Yes. You know the auction. Yeah. And he raised almost seven million pounds in two years, and that money was used for ARVs, you know, for for research in, in Kenya. You know, they had this pilot project where they were researching ARVs on children in Kenya. So it's but. It's the public that does that. Mm. It's not governments, it's not the private sector, it is not powerful people, although powerful people come in, you know, and sometimes they raise money, you know, but it's ordinary people who do that. Um, sorry, I'm going to ask you another good question, but just before I do, um, is it possible to move your light? Because every time you get passionate and, and move your hand, it, it throws a okay. dark shadow. And, okay, okay. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, though, that the public does enough? Um, because what it seems like the, your, your Forgotten Children of Zimbabwe generated a lot of interest from people outside of Zimbabwe. It's the same as in South Africa. We kind of seem to have this um, disgust of what's going on around us, but an apathy when it comes to action. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why I really wanted to speak to you is because what you're doing does create action and does lead to movement. But do you think people are doing enough? And, and if they're not, what should, what should people start doing, even if it's in the small things? Because, you know, not everyone's able to go and dedicate their life to helping out. You know, that's a very valid point. You know, I really don't know. You know, you know I think... I just think we live in this materialist, conspicuous, consumerist world whereby people really think that we are now free, everything is available, and everyone's life is honky-dory. And as a result, when you make documentaries like this, it's usually Africans who attack you. Because either they think that you are lying about something in that film, but part of it has a lot to do with showing people something that makes them feel uncomfortable about themselves. Mm. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yes, it's yeah. one thing saying that we don't want the West to interfere in our stuff. I mean, I'm being simplistic here. Yeah. We don't want the West to interfere with our problems, our stuff. We need to sort out our problems, and that's very valid. And that's very fair. But when I look at the documentaries that I make, you raise so much money and it's really ordinary people giving 10 pounds. Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children had 11,000 Facebook friends in one week. Wow. Sure. And that was generated from England. Do you know what I mean? It's not to say that the British people have got money. People were putting in 5 pounds, 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I... I don't know what's going on. I think maybe there's a poverty of spirit, you know, although I want to think that, you know, Africans, you know, we, we, I want to think that we have humanity. We might not have a lot, and I want to think that what we have is humanity. But I don't want to be romantic about that, because what I do personally, in my tiny personal capacity, shows me otherwise. The one thing that I can only say to people is that you as people or us as people and our countries and as Africans, if we don't collectively become active, put our heads on the line, give, do something with our lives, Africa is going to be a perpetual mess. And if we think that we are going to wait for leadership to do stuff, although leadership is appointed, you know what I mean, to, 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 to do stuff, to represent people, to make sure that there is service delivery, to make sure that this works. You know, if we are going to wait for leadership, then I think that we are in serious trouble. So I don't know what people can do. I just think it's in your heart what you choose to do with your life. It's simple things, you know, how much are you paying your domestic worker? Are you making sure that your domestic worker's child is not going to end up as a domestic worker? You know, if you, 
you know, it's little things like that. It doesn't have to be as drastic as what I do. But truly speaking, how much are you paying your domestic worker? Do you know how many children she has? Do you know what kind of education her children are having? And are you extending yourself that little bit? You know what I mean? That, yeah. okay, fine. You know, because you have the resources, you have the tools, you have the access. Have you tried to get your domestic worker's child into a better school? Because you know that as a privileged person, black or white in this country, you can have access to, to, to meeting a headmaster or whatever, you know. So I, there's a lot we can do as, as people, you know, and I, yes, there's a lot that we can do. So I, I think the, the, the challenge is everybody needs to have that own sense of responsibility. But for that, we need people like you to keep that sense of responsibility in our minds sight. Um, because it's so easy to fall back into our bubble and go and have cocktails at news cafe on a Friday and, you know, and, and not worry about what's happening around us. Uh, but you know what, sweetheart? I, ooh, I'm a kugel myself. I like French champagne. I don't even want South African sparkling wine, if I if I can tell you. I like French champagne. I wear Chanel number no. five. I like Clarence. So you know. <laughs> so, so, so where's the bad? I I I am a Google. At some point, you know what? Girl has to live. You know what I mean? Girl has to have a great time. You know, I've just come from Mauritius where I had a great holiday. You know, I didn't kill Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, you know, I said, believe, give me a break. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, uh, there are boundaries to everything. Yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So it's important that I do what I do because I'm passionate about it. And nobody ever said that actually socialists cannot wear Chanel number five. But at the same time, um, it's important for me to continue doing what I do because I have a child. What am I going to tell my child when I'm trying to raise a, a very conscious child, a child who must know their space in the world, a child who must claim their space in the sun, a child who knows that they have the ability to make a difference in this world. So now, if I don't do what I do or try to do something with my life, my child is going to ask me, so what did you do with your life? What difference did you make? Other than worrying, you know what I mean, uh, whether your eye cream is getting finished. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that you, you, it starts with you. You know, you know be, be the change you want to see in the world. But it doesn't mean that, you know, you, you, you can't have fun. Yeah. And I guess it's important to have that balance anyway. Um, mm -hmm. because, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, with, with going back to Forgotten Children of Zimbabwe and, and your, your other documentaries, it's the amount of honest con connections that you generate with these children is, is probably what makes the documentary such, such a success. But how do you get that to get a, a child to open up to you so um, um, so honestly and, and so vulnerably? Um, is, is that something that's just your maternal instinct comes out, or do you find that these children are just looking for someone to talk to who, who will listen to them? Children are looking for someone to talk to who will listen to them. However, it is not all children who are going to open up. Some, you try, it just doesn't work, and you move on. Uh, but also I think that, generally speaking, as a human being, I'm just a straight shooter. You know what I mean? I'm so frank. I'm yes. so straightforward, you know. And, and uh, I can't stand duplicity. I don't really have POVs. What you see is what you get. So I think that energy comes out, you know. Uh, yeah, what you see is what you get with me. And... Uh, Often, even when I do say something which is not particularly comfortable, that's just what it is. But I think ultimately it's really about these children wanting someone to talk to them and wanting to be heard. Yeah. You know, Toni Morrison said something that I've never forgotten, where she said, you know, us as human beings, all we want is to be affirmed. 
And a child, all a child wants when she walks into the room is for people's eyes to light up. See me, hear me, I'm here. Poor people, poor children, poor people are a nuisance in society in terms of how people perceive them. Mm -hmm. And a poor parent, a parent who's tired, a parent who can't put food on the table, a parent who's too ill, is most probably not going to have the energy or the time for her eyes to light up each time Kitu Metsi walks into the room. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that it's, it's a very, very valid point. And I also like saying to people that if you choose in life to see the God in everybody, in everybody, you will find the God in that person. Whether it's a serial rapist, I mean, this is really, really radical stuff. Yes. <laughs> or whether it's whatever, because I'm a person who really, really believes that um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's society that actually ends up determining how the human being, you know, turns out. So I think you can, <laughs> because we are all, you know, we are, we are all creations of God. Mm. So that if you choose to find the God in somebody, the person will respond to that. Have, have you ever had to interview someone who's kind of like a, like a, a serial rapist or someone who has, has done things that you, re, you drastically disagree with and had to do that yourself? Yeah, I did. I did once interview someone who has done dreadful things. I was part of a program that went to Sun City where we were a group of us, it was a leadership program, and we met people who were in maximum security, young people, some of them, who had killed, who had raped, who were serving life, who were, uh, who'd been there for 25 years. Because I also believe in the corrective justice system. I believe in that. Because I really believe that uh, human beings can be can be helped. The only human beings, I think, where they are coming up with studies where it's almost impossible to rehabilitate them are pedophiles. You know, studies around that. You know, yeah. But <clears throat> otherwise, I did. And I came across these people who, by the way, they were, they, they, they were repetitive about what they had done and they were trying to, to mend their ways and in our group it was very interesting how different human beings relate to those types of people. I was more open in engaging and trying to understand their backgrounds and trying to understand where they come from as people and then trying to understand what made them do the things that they did. And certain people were revolted, were upset, where they think those people should be locked up and throw away the key, or let's bring the death penalty. I mean, those are all different views. Yeah. I believe that there is a God in everybody, and I believe in the restorative justice system, and I really, really believe that in this world, if we just took enough time to put in more resources in terms of people's basic needs, mm. to give people decent wages and not be in a world was now we are in a super capitalist system now whereby it's about squeezing people, it's about maximization of profits. Of course we are going to create the world that we are creating now. Mm. Of course. You know, it's, it's, it's inevitable that we are going to have a, a world that is so angry, that is so disjointed. Mothers are killing children and people can judge and say, oh, but you're a mother, how could you do? No, she's probably mentally ill, she's probably sick, she's probably frustrated, she probably hasn't had a job, you know what I mean? And it's very easy for middle class people to judge. Yeah. Very easy. Because in my middle class lifestyle, I have someone to take care of my child when I go to work. 
I can put food on the table. Mm -hmm. I can go on holiday. So let's let's flip the coin as people and let's try, you know, at working for a, a more just society. So, okay, um, I completely agree with everything that you're saying, but, <clears throat> but it is hard to make those changes without the leadership getting involved. And I think it's kind of, it's, uh, what I do want to ask you is, is what if if you if if you were president of the country for for a day, what changes would you make? What do you think are the most important aspects? And I know it's a silly question because it, it, it would never happen. But from a from society's point of view, what are those important changes that we need to make in in, in our country? Because the question that I ask everyone when I interview as well is, what should every South African do today for themselves to make the the country a different a better place? But I think you have a more macro view, especially based on your experiences. If I were president of this country, and mind you, I probably would do a better job than the present president. <laughs> um, I would really, really focus on early childhood development. South Africa's biggest, biggest problem at this point in time is that the education system is so bad for poor people and it's not getting better. And with a very uneducated populace, and when I say uneducated, I'm talking about serious stuff, where kids who are probably in standard six, standard six can't read and write, you know, with all the resources that we have. You are not going to have a strong country. You are not going to have a strong economy. You are not going to be able to compete globally. And you are not going to have people who've got a very, very strong, basic sense of self-worth. You know, invest in early childhood development. That is what I would do. For instance, in this country, you know, you have so many women who work, whether in factories or what domestic workers, who are really earning your, your low-end uh, wages. In the townships, there aren't any good nurseries that are supposed to be funded by government. You know, because we know it has been proven that a child's most crucial time is zero to five. So if you don't harness a child's potential, yes. you are not harnessing the country's wealth, mm. the country's human resources, the country's future leadership. That's one. Mm. The second thing is that as a leader, because, you know, young people are just really, really, really important. I would instill a value of young people not wanting to wait for government, what government can do. You know the fantastic thing about having grown up in Zimbabwe and having been educated in Zimbabwe? Somehow the education system geared you towards going out into the world. And when you go out into the world, you shine. You, 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 you make a difference. Mm. And, you know, the sky is your blackboard. And you can write whatever verse mm -hmm. you need to write. And so it's, it's it, <laughs> no wonder Zimbabweans globally, my generation and those who are slightly o older, they shine. Even the ones who are younger, you know, because apart from a very good education system, you never grew up with this thing of government is going to do this for me. So I think that, you know, focus on early childhood development, focus on, on young people, focus on, on hard work, because actually hard work does pay off. Yeah. Focus on less conspicuous consumerist stuff, because young people, I mean, if gold rusts, what should iron do? You know, so young people look up to these people in leadership. So if it is a lifestyle of, um, of champagne, Manolo Blonik, first class, you know what? Richard Branson's kids don't even fly business class. They don't. There is something to be learned from that. And he's got all the money in the world because yeah. guess what? It's his money. He worked for it. 
it's not their money. So I think that it's really about a value system that we need to start inculcating in terms of the way we live ourselves as people, as Africans, and then that will permeate, you know, to our kids. <clears throat> Can I ask you, has, has your daughter um, watched your, your documentaries and has she been impacted by them? Or? She, I, mean, I don't think you sit and watch, but if I'm watching with some people, oh no, mommy, I don't like your films. They're too sad. They're too sad. Why don't you make something happy? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she's only five. Yeah. So she's only five, going on to 15. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's also very difficult to raise a child. <clears throat> I'm raising a daughter, a daughter who likes Barbie, and I'm battling with Barbie's image mm. because uh, it doesn't represent her image. Yeah. And uh, and mommy is very politically conscious, and I worry about images around whiteness about my child uh, being exposed to, um, to white standards of beauty because then, you know, they end up having conflicts within yes. themselves at certain points. <clears throat> um, I worry about conspicuous consumerism. When my daughter wants something, even if I can afford it, I say no because uh, it's not about her having what she wants when she wants. Mm. Um, I worry about certain things and I want her to be confident, safe, strong in this world. But at the same time, South Africa is a misogynist society. So I worry when she becomes a teenager and she wants to go out and date, you know, how late will she stay out mm -hmm. in this society of ours? Is she going to be strong enough? to navigate her way, you know what I mean, in the world. So I do, I'm concerned about quite a few things in terms of the world she is going to inhabit. And I guess uh, as a parent, all you can do is try and instill certain values in, into, into her and wisdom. Um, you gave me some advice when we started on, on my wife who's pregnant now for her not to be anxious and the baby won't be anxious. But some some what are the kind of the, the parenting aspects or, or do you have any principles that you try and instill in your daughter that you think are, are important um Which i'm not use? i'm not spoiling yeah i'm quite strict i'm loving i'm firm but i'm quite strict uh i instill that she should have respect for everybody whether it's the guy who sweeps the streets when she meets him, she must greet him, look him in the eye with the same respect that she is going to give to, say, someone like Nelson Mandela. Okay. You know Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. You know it, and uh, you should, it's a fabulous poem. And it talks about, uh, because his son died, and he wrote this poem for his child, and he talks about how when you walk, amongst king and queens and you also walk amongst the poor but you keep your head and level above you at the same level then you're a man my child mm -hmm. it's beautiful so i don't want a child who is going to you know it happens of course they are kids but maybe tomorrow who's gonna meet will smith and be so gaga over will smith and and, and give him the utmost respect, but she fails to give uh, respect to the guy who comes at our gate and he says, please, can I have a glass of water or a slice of bread? Yeah. My child must look into that man's eyes with the same respect that I, she will give to a teacher or yeah. anyone else. And, uh, it, it comes back to what you said earlier about when a child walks into the room that all the eyes are on her and, and she shines. And it's a sad... And, and I think that's kind of, uh, it's in, interesting you say that because it, that comes through in your movies um, and your documentaries, it's giving that respect to, er, any, what, to everybody and those that don't get respect. But I'll be nothing without all of these people. I would be nothing, you know, without the support of poor people. And my father told me that actually, it's funny, he was dying, he was on his dying bed, he had, he had cancer. 
And he told me something I've, I've never forgotten. He said to me, my child, you know, because I, I came from England in 96 and I was getting tired. I couldn't get a job. I was getting pissed off. And then I thought, ah, I'm going back to England, you know. So I went to visit my father in the trans guy. I said, oh, I can't deal with this. I'm going back. Mm -hmm. And then my father said to me, you know what? It's your choice. If you are going to go back and if you are going to cry about the fact that you haven't, you haven't had a job for eight months and us, your parents, we fought this unjust system all our lives and our grandparents and everybody and you can just give up in such a short space of time. Oh. Go back, my child. But when you come back to South Africa five, ten years later and white people are still in power and black people are still being treated badly, you have nobody but yourself to blame. And he said to me that you would need to work and remember that the privilege, the education you've had or the access to the people you have, there was a reason. You need to work at uplifting the race. You need to work with poor people because those are the people who are going to create you and destroy you. You are black, you're a woman, your people have a long way to go. And it's your job to work within those structures. And I've never forgotten that because those are the people who make me and those are the people tomorrow who are going to destroy me. And when you say they're going to destroy you, what do you mean by that? Well, if you have contempt for poor people, okay. which many people do, they might not necessarily destroy you as people, but karma will do something to you. Because many people have contempt for poor people. Because poverty is ugly. Yeah. It's dirty. We don't want to be associated with it. So that attitude. So when I say that they create me, they make me, they give me access into their lives. Mm. They're the people who pray for my success. You know? So I... I I've been nothing with that. I mean, I, I'm not putting it in a romantic sense. Oh, poor people, I'm poor people. No, I've told you that I'm a bit of a kugel. I like this, I like that. But my issues are about poverty, injustice. You know what I mean? Because poverty is a human rights issue. Yes, yeah. So I mean it within that context. Okay. Uh, I, I want to ask you, you've got a lot of um, wisdom, a lot of, influences in your life from, from as you said, your, your, your parents to literature and that. What, 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 are, what do you think are the people, the, the books, the resources, the experiences that have shaped you and made you who you are um, and that you draw on to, to guide you? You know, I, I'm just blessed, man. You know, I'm just one of those people that God just opened so many doors for me. I've met amazing people, but I look for the God in everybody. I honestly do. The person who shaped me the most, okay, when I went to Zimbabwe when I was three years old with my mother, then she married into the Sitole family. Uh, they were fairly middle class. And where we lived, um, everyone else was sending their children to multiracial schools. It was Rhodesia then during that time. Mm -hmm. There weren't many multiracial schools that accepted black kids. Edson Sitole, who was my um, cousin, who, as I said to you, he was abducted. He was a political activist. He was a lawyer. In fact, he was the first doctor of laws in Southern Africa. Wow. That's how brilliant wow. he was. That's he had a profound, in the first thing that he did, when my mother wanted to take me to a multiracial school, he said, there's no child in this family who is going to go to a white school until this country is free. The second thing that he did, he didn't have a child, you know, and so he took me everywhere. That's how I got to have access into Zimbabwe, because the chief justice of Zimbabwe was his best friend. Okay. So I could go back to Zimbabwe. I could speak to the leadership because a lot of them were represented by him. 
you know, when they were imprisoned. Okay, wow. And so he was, uh, he was abducted in 1975 because he was seen as a threat in collaboration with the South African regime during that time. So Edson Sitole had a profound influence. So then what happened was that I ended up in the middle class uh, area that I grew up in, black middle class. I was sent to a school in the village. So you can imagine, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but children are great. We adapt. So, and so I was immersed in the Shona culture and cultures have amazing wisdoms. Mm. And he was a human rights activist. So there was just, I always grown up with this sense of uh, fairness, justice. And that's not to say that I am wonderful, I'm not. I mess up, uh, I can be dodgy at times, but I own up. You know, I'm human, it's human to err. Yeah. You know, so I, I was taken to a boarding school in the village. And that's when the Chimurenga war was very, very, very hot. So I was then part of witnessing the Chimurenga war in the rural area. And all the middle class kids I had grown up with didn't know what the blazes was going on. So I'd come back and I'd say, oh, no, 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 we met the freedom fighters, this, this and that. So it always, it gave me a certain sense of time, place, space, and a certain access. Yeah. that middle-class kids did not have. You know what I mean? Yes. So that's why I'm doing this thing, you know, Child of the Revolution. Because if I look at most of my friends I grew up with, they are not any, they know in terms of reading, but yes. they didn't experience that. Yes. Can, can, can you tell us more, uh, more about um, Child of the Revolution? Because that sounds like an incredibly interesting um, piece of work. I explore in Child of the Revolution, as a child who was raised during a revolution, yeah. I explore the complexity of Zimbabwe, of uh, colonialism, the far-reaching consequences of that, because I was in Zimbabwe during the time of colonialism. Mm -hmm. I explore Lancaster House Agreement, which was uh, a negotiated settlement, which has also had far-reaching consequences to how Zimbabwe has played out. The same thing with South Africa, you had Kodesa. And South Africa will play out in its own time because that's some of these, some of these things are inevitable. It's part of processes. It's part of uh, people trying to find autonomy, self-rule. If people have been exploited uh, for the last 300 years where they have been stripped of a sense of who they are, and I also explored the uh, dichotomy and the duplicity of being African in a modern world and, and, and the contradictions that we face, you know what I mean? Or our leadership, the contradictions that, you know, our African leadership face, you know, yeah. within the context of the modern world. But essentially the film is about me looking at Zimbabwe through my eyes. And I look at the role of Zimbabwe that Zimbabwe has played in the liberation of this country. I, I, I'm making a film that's complex, that does not throw away the baby, the bucket and the water. I'm making a film that is a mirror for many other young people who have grown up in Africa or in the developing world. It could be South America, it could be uh, Allende's child, during the time when he was deposed because he was also a child of the revolution or she and what happens you know people go in with this goodwill people are prepared to sacrifice their lives for countries what happens i'm trying to understand where does it all go wrong and, and when and, do, do, do you get an answer i mean where does it go wrong <laughs> it's, it, it's multifaceted and I also question my place in that, my participation in that revolution, my complicity as a first generation, successful black person post-independence, yeah. whether it is Zimbabwe or whether it is here. 
my complicity in terms of perpetuating that. Because I think that we become, we become, we, we become complicit inadvertently. Because also, you know what? This life of activism is really, really tiring. Yeah. Also, you know, it's really, 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 you have to be really, really strong. There's a part of me that's like, oh man, I'm just so tired of this, you know. I would really like to fly business class, you know, when I'm queuing up and when I'm going somewhere else. I'm resentful of the yeah. fact that I'm not, because I like nice things, you know. And I'm in economy class and they close that curtain and they're already giving business class people champagne. And I'm like, hell no, I also want to be there. <laughs> But then the fantastic thing about documentaries is that, you know, they, they, they bring you back to the source. Yeah. And they make you see through all of that bullshit, actually, at the end of the day. And you know what? If I die tomorrow, I don't want posterity to judge me for not having tried. Mm. So, so Child of the Revolution is really about a sense of betrayal, but also my complicity in that as well. Uh, because I've also benefited from the revolution. I mean, I, I, I think one of the reasons why I'm a successful filmmaker in this country is because, uh, not I think, I know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Millions of people died for me to be sitting where I am today. So, it, it, you know, the revolution wasn't free, wasn't easy. And what has been my place in that? And... It's, 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 it's been a tough film. I haven't finished it because I'm looking for money to finish it. And, uh, but it's, it, yeah. So I don't know, we'll see. It's still in the edit. So I have no idea where this, you know, the path mm -hmm. this baby is taking. And at the same time, I'm making a film about uh, corrective rape in this country. So I've just finished researching on that. I'm looking for money to start filming in July. So can I ask you, just in terms of the, the documentaries, and if we can maybe talk on this for a little bit, how much research preparation does it go it goes into before you actually do a documentary? How much money does it cost? Um, what are the complexities that are involved in it? I would be happy with about one, with about, with an ordinary documentary, not Child of the Revolution, because Child of the Revolution requires a lot of archive and footage. We are looking at a country over a period of, of maybe 50 years, you know what I mean? Colonialism, independence, all of that. That's a bit different. It was short Zimbabwe back and forth. You know, what's required for a film like that, a 90-minute film like that, is probably about $4 million. Okay. I've made most of that film with my own money. Wow. I haven't been able to raise money and I knew that my uh, my time period of being allowed into Zimbabwe back and forth was only going to be so much. Okay. So I needed to go back and forth. So, you know, I used my own money. I was given money by friends, you know, for me to actually just shoot this film. Mm -hmm. But for an ordinary documentary, like uh, when I say ordinary, I mean you don't have archive, you don't have footage, it's shot, it's shot here, I'm here. I would be happy with about a million, a million brands. You know, I'd be happy with, I could create a very good piece of work with, right. with, with, between a million and a million five, because I take a long time. I take a year, you know, so you research. And sometimes when you are shooting, then you stumble upon some more research, then you divert, because that's just how I work. Yeah. So I take time and a lot of the stuff doesn't end up but I really, really have to say, and you need to include this, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't be where I am today professionally were it not be for the collaboration with True Vision, mm -hmm. this company in England. They saw my very first documentary that I did called Shouting Silent in 2010, and it was about my mother had died of HIV AIDS. So I went around the country looking at young girls and and how they were coping, those ones who had lost their mothers to HIV AIDS. And they saw the documentary. And ever since, we've always created a partnership. You know, and uh, it's easy for them to access money in England. Mm -hmm. The budgets are decent. And not once have I ever been made to feel that uh, I needed to show someone's vision. No. You know, and I, I, and I think that shows in my work. It's very much, 
you know, who I am. Yeah. And so True Vision TV, that's mm. uh, Brian Shipley, no, Brian Woods and Deborah Shipley, Brian directs, or I produce, and Jezza Newman, or, you know, Deborah directs, and I produce. And also I work with the most talented camera woman who's South African called Natalie Harhoff. She's the best there is, you know, in the world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am were it not for for, for those people in terms of supporting my vision mm. continuously. And and so on on a practical level, for anyone who's watching this who wants to become a documentary maker or get into film and production, is there any advice to them on on if the patterns that you see in people that are very successful? So so how does somebody become the best producer, director? Um, um, camera person uh, around tell the story that you want to watch people are always saying make a documentary uh, this particular audience likes that this, uh, 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 uh. make a film that you want to watch if there are no films that you want to watch you make that kind of film the second thing is don't think you're going to make money you're not. Mm -hmm. It's a labor of love. It's documentaries. The third thing is you really, really, what has also helped me in terms of being a documentary filmmaker for as long as I have been is that I actually lead a very simple life. I have very low overheads. That way, I don't have to go and work and do work that I don't like because I need to put food on the table. Okay. I am not servicing a lifestyle. I am not servicing an expensive house. I'm not ex servicing an expensive car. Do you know what I'm trying? Although yes. I do like certain things that are expensive. The but French champagne. <laughs> yes, I like French champagne. I like Chanel Number no. Five. Yeah. I use Clarins. I like going on holiday. My child goes to a great school. Those are not negotiable, and I like great food yeah. and books, books, books. But I think that I always tell young people, don't get caught up with living in these expensive areas. Then you have a huge rent and this, nah. You know, keep it simple because mm. the first documentary that I made, I put my own money in. Child of the Revolution. I've put most of my money in. I'm failing to raise money for that film. And it happens. Richard Attenborough, when you read his book, Up To You Darlings, when he wanted to make Gandhi, he never made money. Sir Richard Attenborough, he wow. didn't. He couldn't find money. Really? Do you know what I mean? And then he wanted to make a document, mm -hmm. uh, not documentary, a film after that. And guess what? You know, he had uh, artwork that he was prepared to sell. Wow. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yes, so yeah. that he could actually come up maybe with research money or development money or whatever. I do that all the time because I make documentaries from a space of response. I respond to a situation and I say, no, I need to tell that story. Okay. The issue of corrective rape, it was a response to what was happening to black women living in townships in this country. I don't have money for that. No one has given me money for that. I've done the research. I want to go and shoot. I don't know if I'll have money. And I'll just have to say, Natalie, please, let's go and shoot. I'll pay you when I get the money. I took Natalie to Zimbabwe to shoot for me. I still haven't paid her. But you know what I mean? And when the yeah. money comes, I pay her. Okay. But it's also about knowing your time and place in history. You are bearing witness. Mm -hmm. And you're bearing witness and you're also doing something that's more profound than making money anyway. So, you, so your principles are very different. What drives you is, is obviously very different. Well, what's quite interesting about the money aspect is that you, you, well, I, I, I don't know how much money you'd make. So, so, so say the movie costs you one and a half million, how much would you make on that? But even though you don't make money, you generate an incredible amount of money that from that film. So if you almost stepped out of the, the social space and went into more of a commercial space, you, you'd probably be rolling in it, um, rolling yeah. in your Chanel. 
Yes, yes, mm -hmm. certainly. But you know what? We are all different. You know, it's important to, to, to make money. It's important, you know, you, you, you need people who are rich and people who do this and do that. It's important for government, NGOs and private uh, sector to work together. But you know what? I've, I have never been driven by money. I've always been driven by something bigger. And maybe it's because I know that I am a very, very wealthy person. I just know I'm an incredibly wealthy person and my sense of self-worth has never been determined by uh, an address or a car. It's never been because I, I, I'm aware of uh, my time and place. I was given an incredible sense of self growing up and uh, I've never been motivated by money. However, what I would really, really like is for me to find my angles. Because Karl Marx was able to produce that phenomenal literature because Engels was, um, you know, was a very, very wealthy landowner, but who saw the importance of what Karl Marx was mm. doing. So that's my one prayer in life that, you know, I, 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 I find my angles. Someone who has so much money and who says, you know what, I really like what you do. How much do you need for this? How much do you need for that? So you can continue doing what you do. Because at this point in time, I'm feeling like, mm, I don't think I want to do this for longer. I want to go and teach. I want to, no, nah, it's too hard. And I have a child to raise, you know, it's too hard. Well, I, I hope you don't because we would be losing some incredible work that um, would <laughs> I believe it changes the world. Um, I want to ask you, 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 you speak about, um, and sorry, is it possible to move slightly or the lamp slightly because you've gone? Is that okay? That is, let's see. Um, there we go. No. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, it's still quite dark, but there, a few, there we go, perfect. Um, you read a lot of books, you say, what are some books that you think everybody should read or that have impact, like I've got a list of books that have impacted my mind um, and kind of changed the way I think about things. What, what are your kind of top five, top three, top two, top 20 books that, that have impacted you? That's a tall order, mm. very, very tall order because I'm, I studied literature at university. So I'm, I'm a literature enthusiast. Yes. Um, everything by John Steinbeck. Okay. That's one. Uh, <laughs> Tony Morrison. Yeah. Tony Morrison, The Bluest Eye. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Okay. Everything by James Baldwin. Yes. I loved The Color Purple. And why I loved The Color Purple, I was in Zimbabwe. I was a 17 year old girl and I was trying to find my space in the sun. And when I read The Color Purple, I, 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 it, I found my space in the sun. When I read, I read Color Purple and Angela Davis, Woman, Class and Race. I'm an Angela Davis girl, okay. big time. And they brought, you know, they just brought it home to me, politically. Um, I could continue being crazy. I could continue being independent. I didn't have to be one of those women who were going to toe the line. Uh, I felt that, uh, yeah, I could just be myself. And society could take it or they could leave it. Because uh, I grew up in, in, in quite a conservative uh, society. Mm. And those two books were very, very profound in giving me a very strong sense of self. You know, I didn't, I didn't have to marry. I didn't have to... I just didn't have to do what I didn't want to do. Mm. And I could just actually live my life and... <laughs> and just be crazy and love my life and 
<laughs> smoke weed if I wanted to smoke weed. <laughs> That's exactly <excessively> liberating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't smoke weed now, uh, but you, then you... at that time, at that time, I thought, wow, okay, I can do this, <laughs> and and who needs judgment, you yeah. know? <laughs> so that's very important for women, especially, because we live in a patriarchal society, yes. and patriarchy is there to put women in their place. That's and what it's there for. And it doesn't make any sense because it's highly patriarchal, but it's the family structure is very matriarchal. And women are kind of the cornerstone of, of society and families, and mm -hmm. which, which, which is one of the things that need to change. Um, I, I, I need to start wrapping up now um, because we're running out of time. But I wanted to ask you, um, do you have any personal quirks, anything that you're obsessive about or do differently or think different to, to anyone else? Something that makes you uniquely yourself? Uh, oh my god, I do. My daughter thinks I'm totally bananas. Um, I'm quite superstitious. Okay. Uh, for instance, when I'm dressing up in the morning and my shirt is inside out, I won't wear that shirt to, 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 to like, you know, to, to, to uh, correct it because I think it's bad luck. So I don't care whether I had chosen this dress for the red carpet and this jacket. Yes. If I wear the jacket the wrong way around, then I have to find another jacket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's Wait. one of my quirks. And um, oh, yeah, that's one of my quirks. I don't know. I mean, I've got quite a few, but I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't remember. Something I'm also quite fascinated about is kind of what goes through your mind. So like when, when you're in the shower or you're shopping or you're just by yourself and you, what are the things that goes through your mind? Are, are you replaying footage that you shot or thinking about concepts or you thinking about your daughter or, or, or what's going on in there? Uh, I like music. So I'm always thinking about music. My favorite musician is Stevie Wonder. Okay. And, um, yeah, I'm a big, big music person. And so even when I'm in a shop, old as I am, when there's a nice song playing, I'll just start dancing. I don't care, you know, whether I'm pushing a trolley. Yeah. I, and also, one of the things that I do, I talk to myself a lot. But as I'm getting older, I'm not shy even if people catch me speaking to myself. Really? Yeah, because, you know, people get shy, then they think, oh, God, someone's going to think. No, I, I couldn't care less. Because I have so many conversations in my mind, whether it's with um, a potential interviewee or whether it's um, a BAFTA acceptance speech, you know, I, I, because I always, yeah, I'm always talking to myself. <laughs> so that's, but I'm not shy to okay. be caught by anyone, you know, when I'm talking to myself. Okay. And, and your all-time favorite Stevie Wonder song? What is that? Oh, uh, oh, um, what is this one called? I mean, there are quite a few, but this, uh, um, it's you bring joy into my eyes, but I also like um, village ghetto land. Okay. Where he says, um, people are eating dog food now. Tell me, would you be happy if? you were living in village ghetto land. Sure. You know, uh, in fact, it's actually one of my biggest inspirations. Really? When I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I'm working, like when I was doing Child of the Revolution, uh, and I've, it's been the most stressful project because I never had money. And I even almost lost my flat because of, because of that. But I mean, I'll never do it again. But I just felt it was such an important story. I would listen to Stevie Wonder, Village Ghetto Land, Joy Inside My Tears. Yes, it's Joy Inside My Tears. And I would also listen to Bob Marley. I like Bob Marley a lot. And I would watch uh, Fidel Castro's documentary. Because I, I adore Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. I think that um, through his faults, he's one person who has lived his talk. And that's a very, very difficult mm -hmm. order. You know, he set about liberating Cuba. He did what he did. He's never, 
been enticed by money. He just did what he did. For those who feel he's a dictator and for those who like him, there was a certain level of integrity with that type of leadership. And I would imagine it's very difficult to have integrity when you're a leader. Yeah, and I think our leaders need a little bit more of um, walking the talk. <laughs> ah, you know, comrade. I don't know. I just think that maybe, you know, it's we are evolving, you know. I, you know, I, I you know, I, I, a lot of things are very disappointing. And a lot of things actually have been great about the new dispensation. The ANC has done a hell of a lot, you know, for this country. But I also think that there are certain areas where the ANC has taken us back, especially with the, um, with the gender issues of this country, with the appointment of Jacob Zuma. That was something that the ANC pushed on some of us, you know, who are supportive of the ANC, where we felt that they could have given us different kind of leadership. And it split women big time you know, uh, the whole appointment. And now the appointment of uh, Justice Mohueng Mohueng, who believes that gays and lesbians can be cured, you know, and at the same time, we are having this hideous, hideous crime that's being performed on uh, black, you know, mainly black lesbian women in the townships. And just the whole denial of people's human rights around the gay issue and, and, and having a chief justice who is so backward in his mm -hmm. thinking, I think that that has really, really taken us backwards big time. Yeah, I don't know. That's... <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, we, we, it's a great country and there is a lot of good that ANC has done that we can work on. I think it's a matter of uh, we need a very strong opposition mm -hmm. um, um, of that belief. And I think that we need to constantly challenge leadership in terms of, you see, we haven't gotten to a stage whereby leadership understands that they are actually our civil servants. Mm -hmm that they are living on taxpayers' money, mm. that we elected them into office to do what they were elected for. And if they don't do that, we take them out. Yeah. You know, our democracy is still fairly young. We haven't gotten to that stage. You know, and, and, and I think, and also another thing as well is that you know, a lot of these guys are, are old and out of touch. Zimbabwe is a case in point. Mm. It's not going to fly. They are too old. They must be all retired. You, you spend a lot of time in, in a place focused on the negative in the world mm. and in our society. Mm. What gives you hope? What is, and, and because we're coming to the end of the interview, so what is, what is, leave us with something of hope and inspiration that drives you, that you hold on to, that, that moves you. That, that you think it's all going to be okay because we can talk about changing structures in society and the education system. We know that's not in reality going to happen very soon. What, what gives me hope is when I look at people who have fought to change things in this world. You look at someone like Yunus Mohammed, the guy who started the Gramini Bank. Yes. You look at the first person who created a social system. I always forget his name. He's, like, he's a Canadian guy. He fought tooth and nail for people to get health care. And when you watch his autobiography, you know, when you read about Yunus Muhammad, when you look at great works of art, you only have to watch a film by someone called Deepa Mehta. Mm -hmm. You only have to watch a documentary called Ethiopia by Clifford Bestel a Cape Town guy. I mean, when I saw Ethiopia, I said to myself, if I was able, if ever I can make a film like that, it's okay, I can retire. But I don't have to go far. Just look at Nelson Mandela. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So who am I in this world with all this privilege that I've had? 
I spend a lot of time in the negative, but I'm actually an eternal optimist. Because I know that I am phenomenal. I was made in God's image and I was born to shine. And so when you light, you know, when you shine your light, you are giving other people permission to do the same. And you are unashamedly, do you know what I mean, shining your light. So yes, I spend a lot of time in the negative. I get very depressed about it. But at the same time, there is something about, I see it as shining my light in that darkness. That is how I see it. And fortunately, the work that I have done has always garnered the most amazing, amazing response in terms of making sure that the people in the films are taken care of, raises money, raises awareness, which I don't really have anything to do with. But I guess that is where my wealth comes in. Yeah. What, 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 more, what more do I want, actually? Exactly. To be able to have that kind of access and for people to give you that kind of access mm. and for you to be able to interpret it into images. It is shining a light on, on something. And to be able to wish Chanel number five every day. <laughs> what more could I wish for? <laughs> okay, I've, I've got one last question to, to, to ask you. <laughs> okay. Um, is who do you think I should interview next and what do you think I should ask them? There's quite a few people I think you should interview. Ah, okay. Who do I really love and admire? I think you should interview Eunice Muhammad. He's on the list. I really think you should interview Yunus Mohammed. I, in terms of people who are, you know what, someone I really have a lot of respect for is Trevor Manuel. I need to tell you this quickly. I, when I made the Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children, I was so afraid, I mean, I didn't make it when, 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 when Jezza Newman and myself made the film. I was so afraid to what was going to happen to some of those people in the film, okay? So, no, honey, I'm doing a, a proper interview, darling. Two minutes. Okay? Mommy's almost finished. Um, I was so scared to what was going to happen to the people in the film. The BBC had set aside a certain amount of money that should the people want to leave Zimbabwe, come here, you know, we could do that. Okay. But I needed to speak to the Minister of Home Affairs because Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children, as a documentary, if you were to make a film like that in the UK or in America, the government would actually help you mm. to try and secure safety for those people. Because the last thing you want is to make a film and then you leave and then something happens to those people. Yes. So I didn't know how to get hold of them uh, as a filmmaker. You know, and I thought, oh God, they're going to think that this woman is just, you know, totally bonkers. So I bumped into Trevor Manuel in, 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 in Woolies, in Kilani. I introduced myself. I told him that I had made this documentary and I was scared and I needed the South African government to support me. Yeah. Should there be a, a need to evacuate people because the film was bigger than me, was bigger than a lot. Okay, honey. I'm, I'm, okay. Yeah. Sweetie, can you just give me five minutes? Okay, darling. So, you know, Trevor Manuel took my card and he said to me, I would like to see your documentary. He f his assistant or driver phoned me the following morning, came to pick up the documentary. I think he watched it with his staff. Tenji, where I am having an interview and you standing there, it's affecting the light of the Skype. Okay, honey? I think he watched it with his staff or something like that. He got in touch with the DG of Home Affairs. The DG of Home Affairs phoned me. My government 
was ready to support me should I have wanted that support. From that day, I call him Captain My Captain. I don't know if you've watched uh, Tenji. I am working. I don't know if you've watched uh, the film with Robin Williams. Yeah. That um, Dead Poets Society. Yeah, yes. Dead Poets Society. And I, I love that film. And I love Robin Williams. Captain, my captain. Yes. So from that day onwards, I call him Captain, my captain. That for me is... Uh, it's someone who is incredibly brilliant. Incredibly amazing. But here I was, an ordinary person he met in, and he was just doing his civic duty. Mm. And still and, seems to continue to do so. And the, and, 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 and the DG of Home Affairs called me. And then I said to myself, wow, this is amazing. So I think he's, he's special. And I call him Captain, my captain. Okay. <laughs> and Eunice Muhammad is special. There are many people who are special, mm. you know, and um, there are just so many people. Shalane Hunter Gold is very special. She's my mentor. She worked, I don't know if you know her. No. I think you should interview her in terms of her activism okay. in the liberation of this country. Top journalist, the first black woman to be accepted into a university in America. After wow. the famous, after the famous Brown versus Board, you know, um, case in the states where they allowed black people to go into white universities, and she, she has, she's she's just done so much, and incredibly generous has opened up a lot of spaces for women, you know, uh, and I think that also someone you should interview is 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 the guy who runs True Vision TV. Mm. They have done, Google them. Okay, they have yeah, done the I'm most, like they're the top documentary filmmakers in the world. But the amount of awareness and the money they raise for the films and certain issues are taken to parliament, certain laws are changed because of their activism. <coughs> I think that they, sh <coughs> they should be interviewed. Okay. And Stevie Wonder as well. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, what, 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 what? From your lips to God's ears. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll pull you into that one when I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Stevie Wonder is, is, is the business. Okay. Okay, yeah. so w what is your, your final message to South Africa, to the world that, that you want to get across? <sighs> Follow your bliss. Do what you love doing, the rest will follow. And don't chase after money. Don't chase, the money will come. Don't chase after money. The money will come. Follow your bliss, provide a good service. Follow your bliss. I've never heard anyone say follow your bliss and it's perfect. No, you do. You, you, you follow because we all have, God gave us talents, all of us. And uh, it would be a travesty, you know. Follow your bliss because that bliss will give you courage to take the road less traveled, to walk into the unknown and to still stand your ground because that bliss will give you the faith because faith is about saying this is what I want to do. I have no idea where it's going to take me, but I know it feels right. And courage, one of the most important virtues, you know, but, and when you are in that space, you know, when you are in that space with your oneness with God and following your bliss, everything else, you know, will happen. Mm. For, and also the other thing as well, that's very important is that every time when you want to do something, examine your intention. Intention is very important as to why you want to do what you want to do. And yeah, and also wallflowers never changed history. <laughs> yeah. They never did. Mm -hmm. hmm. So when you have a daughter, that's what you must tell her. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, strong, strong people also have it rough, huh? Because you, you, you are not conforming, people are threatened by that, 
you know so uh you need to give your daughter a very strong sense of self in a very patriarchal society mm -hmm. and she must follow her bliss mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. um i would like to say that i've been touched over the last hour and almost 20 minutes i think that we've been going um you have an incredible sense of wisdom that you've shared with us and and inner beauty that just shines here and I, i've i've um, I could sit here and talk to you for another few hours um, and just keep <laughs> on pulling that from you. When um, I come to Cape Town, I'll email you yeah, and we'll do. have lunch. Please we'll do. have lunch. Yeah, I'll introduce no. you to my wife as well. Yes, yes, yeah. and your lovely and daughter. My, my lovely daughter. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But thank you so much. Uh, no, like the pleasure just, is mine. Uh, you're pleasure you're my mine. captain, my captain. Uh, no. <laughs> and, and, I'm going to put the trailer to, to your to your documentaries below here. Let us know when um, Children of the Revolution comes out. Yeah, but but is, please, um, please mention True Vision. True, uh, d yes, and I'm going to interview please them Please mention well. yeah. how, and Natalie Hardhoff, okay. how I wouldn't be where I am because of, of, of those people. Okay. You know, and, uh, and thank you so much. And I wish you the best. How is your business doing? My, my business is good, so I've, I've got a, a marketing business on the side, which, um, and I'll be very honest with you, that was to pay the bills and, and yeah, chase yeah. The, the, the money. Um, mm -hmm. What I want to get into is, is kind of doing what you're doing, is, is social activism and making an impact, because that's what life's about, and um, education is my big passion, my big area, and, and I think nice. I need to get off my bum and, and actually start making stuff happen because if we don't sort out education in this country, um, yeah. not only is there a ticking time bomb, but there are just lives being wasted. And, and especially mm -hmm. with, in, in your documentaries, you see these kids that are so smart and so intelligent mm -hmm. and, and just, it's, it's, it's probably the biggest crime um, mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. is affecting society today. So, mm -hmm. Let me tell you a quick, 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 quick thing that happened since you spoke about education. In January, I was doing research for a documentary that I was doing, a, a six-minute. And I went to a school downtown Johannesburg, which is really not resourced, quite pure, poor kids. And, blah, blah, blah. and basically, when I was waiting to see the headmistress mm -hmm. on the wall, there were three kids who had been their metric high achievers in 2011. The top kid had a South African name, the second kid had a Zimbabwean name, and he had six distinctions. And so I asked them, you know, what's happened to this Zimbabwean kid? It was in January. And they said to me that he's at home, he doesn't have money, he doesn't have a scholarship, nothing. So I asked them to ask the kid to call me. So this was a Wednesday, I remember very well. And the kid called me, I said, look, I'm not rich, but just write me a letter telling me that because the kid had been accepted to UCT to do actuarial science wow. and, me and mechatronics engineering. Yeah. He had been brought here by his sister who was a waitress so she could put him through school. And so uh, he wrote a letter and asking me for money and then also putting his uh, results in the letter of acceptance. This was a Wednesday. I sent an email appeal because he had to be at UCT if he was going to make it mm. on Monday. I sent an appeal to people who were on my email list. Not all of them, but some of them. And by Monday, I had raised 38,000 rands. Jeepers, wow. This boy boarded the train on a Saturday. He came here, he didn't even have pajamas, didn't have a coat. I had a friend, the husband had died, she donated her clothes. Uh, a woman at some school is paying for, every month gives him 2,000 rands, paying for his upkeep in terms of food. The long and short of it, my own doctor, because he had to have, have medical examination, and so I took him there. She, she, she didn't charge him because he's a foreign student. So he had to go and have x-rays. She referred him to somebody. And I was sitting in, 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 in the doctor's rooms talking about this brilliant child and how I'm raising money. There was a girl in there, young girl. She started tweeting her friends. You know, mm. people put in from 120 rands to 5,000 rands. He is at UCT now, and he is studying mechatronics. Wow. 
as I'm still raising money for him. Okay. So it's doable. Yeah. And this was this was a random act of kindness. I couldn't walk away. I couldn't. I just couldn't walk away. So my dear, the sky is your blackboard. Mm. Okay. Okay. Please, can you, if you are still raising money for him, send the email through to me. I will. Um, I will because he has to be there for four years. Yeah. So it's an account, the UCT account, and his yeah. reference name. Okay. And he is there. Maybe invite him for lunch. I was going to say, I, I would love to meet him. Yeah, yeah. he's called Kudzaichi Tambara. He's a very, very humble, shy guy. And um, it, it was, I think that's the best thing I've ever done with my life. Really? Because they, they, I didn't know this person. Yes. There was no payoff for me. When you make a documentary, at least you get paid. Yes. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And it's your profession and you, there was nothing. I just couldn't walk away. Wow. And it was so, it was just fabulous to, to, to be able to just be able to do that mm. for someone you don't know. And I realized how easy it is to make a huge difference in someone's life. And the irony of it, if I've got a friend of mine who's a multimillionaire, I called him. He couldn't give me a cent. Really? <laughs> yes. And I remember, I adore my friend. Don't get me wrong, he's yeah. still my friend. But the lesson for me in all of that was that it made me realize how wealthy I am. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh,